All right, folks. Hope you had a nice long three-day weekend. I know I did. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and start off with our notes of how to measure mass and volume. So the first thing we're going to look at is how to measure mass using the electronic balance. So starting off, the electronic balance measures mass. And the unit on that will be grams. Okay, And sometimes you'll see grams just symbolized by the little letter G. So if you see 50 G, that means 50 grams, okay? Now some key things that you should always do when you use a balance. First, you should always use the same balance for the entire experiment. So in my uh, prep room over here to my right, there are six different balances lined up. So at the beginning of the lab, if you and Jimmy, your partner, use balance number two, so the second one from the left, when you go back to weigh something at the end, you should use balance number two again. So always use the same balance every experiment. And that doesn't mean you have, if you use a balance on a Tuesday, three months later on a Wednesday, uh, you don't have to use that same balance, okay? Just make sure in one single day that you are always using the same balance. Now, the other thing that you should always do when you're using a balance is you should tear, quote unquote, tear the balance before use. Another word we have for this is zero the balance. So sometimes you'll hear me say zero the balance or you'll hear me say tear the balance. It means the same thing. So go ahead and check out the video real quick here to get an idea of what that is. All right, kids. So we got to talk about how to use the balance. Now, one thing that's really important is that you need to make sure you tear or sometimes zero the balance before you use it. You'll notice that this balance has a number on it already. So Sally comes over here, she's like, okay, let's go ahead and get our amount, boom. All right, looks like we got 7.86 grams. Like, uh, Sally, newsflash, that number wasn't zero when we started, so now we don't really actually know how much was in here. Like, well, did you look at the number before we started? Like, no, I wasn't paying attention because I thought you knew how to use a balance, Sally. Let's go ahead and try that again. Here's what you really should do. So the moment you walk up to a balance, Okay, the first thing you should do is boom, you tear it or you aka hit that zero button. So now it's at zeros. In other words, we're like, hey balance, what you currently have on you doesn't count towards the mass. I just wanna count what happens now. So now as you add your substance, like okay, I know for sure that all the powder I just added in there is 5.02 grams and it does not include the little dish or anything else. So that is a proper way to tear or zero the balance before you use it. Okay, now we need to talk about mass by difference. So let's say you have a beaker with stuff in it at the end of the experiment. So if you wanna find the mass of just the stuff in the beaker, here's what you can do. If you find the mass of the total system, so that's the beaker and stuff. If you subtract the mass of the container, the beaker by itself, then you should be able to find the mass of the stuff or whatever it is you have in that container and check out the video here to see an example of that. All right, folks. Now let's talk about this idea of mass by difference. So let's say you did an experiment and at the end you wanna know how much powder you got in your little beaker container here. How much powder did you create? So you're like, okay, well, I hit zero before I start, and boom, I must have gotten about 35.91 grams of powder. Like, um, well, but what about the beaker? I don't care about the mass of this beaker this is in. I want to know the mass of just this powder that's in the bottom of this beaker. How do I do that? So here's the situation. If we were to rewind in time, okay, before the beginning of the lab, here's what you should do. You should find out, so hit zero again before you use it. You should find out the mass of the beaker when it's empty. Okay, so this time it's 32.91. And you will write that number down. That's the mass of your empty container. So then at the end of lab, let's say you wind up with a number like this. So like, okay, so now it's 37.65. So, but this is the container and your product, this is the total mass of your system. So if you find a difference between 37.65 and the mass of the beaker when it was empty, 
you can find the mass of the powder that's in the bottom of this beaker by itself. All right, folks. So now we got to talk about how to measure volume using a graduated cylinder. But before we do that, the most important part of this video, awesome dad joke. Look at this little guy. He's a graduated cylinder. Look at his little hat. He's got his tassel. Okay. All right. I know that like 87% of you are super disappointed. Like 13% of you are low key like, that joke is fire. Not really. But anyways, let's talk about how to actually use a graduated cylinder. So <clears throat> when you're measuring volume, okay, your units are going to be in liters with a capital L as a symbol, or lots of times milliliters in our class because the volume amounts that we need are not that big. They're usually smaller than a liter itself. A liter is kind of a lot. So uh, you'll often see liters or milliliters with a little ML. Uh, milliliters are a thousand times smaller than a liter, but we'll get into that when we get to conversions. Just know those are the units we're talking about. Now, one thing that's really important is always rinse your graduated cylinder in between uses. Sometimes when you measure chemical A, chemical B that you're measuring right after that could have a reaction with that. So you measure chemical A, you pour that into your container, you rinse, you rinse, you rinse, and that way when you measure some chemical B, volume, uh, you don't have A and B marrying themselves into the graduated cylinder because that could be problematic. Anyways, now there are a lot of different sizes of graduated cylinder. You will have a couple different sizes in your drawers when we return. Uh, the size, how do you pick what size to use? Go with the size that is closest to the amount that you're using. So if I'm like, all right, Billy, get me 91 milliliters of blah, 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 blah. So Billy's like, well, okay, so I'm just gonna fill my 10 milliliter graduate cylinder up nine times, and then I'll get a, a 10th measurement of one milliliter, like, Bill, Bill, no, just use the 100 milliliter graduate cylinder for that, okay, because it's closest to what you're looking for. So use your head, it's kind of intuitive, common knowledge there. Now, one thing you need to be really careful of is that you're always aware of the increments. So when I say increments, I mean each one of these little tick marks going down the side of your graduated cylinder. So you need to make sure you always know how big each one of those tick marks are. They're not always the same size. So this guy right here, so we see a zero, we see a 10, and that's probably milliliters. So we see here, like, okay, well, how big is each one of these unmarked little ticks here? So let's see here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so there's 10 spots in between zero and 10, so that tells us that each one of these is one milliliter and over here we got two milliliter increments and you can tell there's five slots in between the zero and the ten so ten divided by five is two over here we have five slots in between one and two so um that's going to come out to be 0 0.2 milliliter marks or increments this guy over here is half milliliter marks and so you just sort of have to use your brain there make sure you're just paying attention to what increments you're working with all right, now, how to read a graduated cylinder. So you always wanna make sure you get down to eye level with a graduated cylinder. So check out what I mean here in this video. All righty, folks. So now we got the eye level view here. And this won't be a, the perfect view since we're on camera here, but you can tell that if you're at eye level, you can really get a feel for that meniscus, this little curve right here. Um, and sometimes during lab will be especially helpful if you hold a piece of paper behind to kind of get a good view of like, all right, where exactly does that meniscus fall in this graduated cylinder? And again, when we do this in person, you'll really be able to see that curve. So as you just saw, we want to be at reading graduated cylinders at eye level. And this is because of that curve in the surface of the water, aka the meniscus. So water has a little bit of a curve. You can kind of see that here little bit of a curve there and if you don't believe me get like a small like kind of taller skinny glass of water in your house later today and you might be able to see a little bit of a curve in there if you look at it at eye level uh, you'll need a, like a skinnier glass to be able to see that more easily and you always want to read at the bottom of that curve so you see this eye here maybe if i can redraw that curve this eye is reading at the bottom of that curve not the top edges over here and 
Now, step six, read one place after the last line you see. So this is really important. So let me go through this. We always want to estimate one time. So here, okay, we got 60 down here, 65. That means this mark is 61, this is 62, this is 63, this is 64. So let's talk about what we know for sure, what we know for sure. Okay, well, our meniscus uh, is definitely in the 60s. So I know for sure that it's 60 something, okay? So I know that, there's no doubt I'd bet a million dollars on it. And if I look carefully, my meniscus is in between the 63 and the 64. So that means I know for sure, I know for sure I would bet a million dollars that this is 63 something. And so we always want to be able to estimate one place. How do I know what I'm estimating? When well, you no longer know for sure. Okay, so I'm looking at this. It's most of the way up the in between 63 and 64. This is kind of right here. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to guess it's like 63.7 maybe. Now, am I going to bet a million dollars that this is 63.7 and not 63.6 or 63.8? Like, uh, no, I don't think so. And I'm not totally making this up. I can tell it's not 63.0. This is definitely like most of the way up. So this isn't random or anything like that. It's an educated guess. It's an estimation. So I went with 63.8. Like, okay, so 63.8. And that last number is estimated, whereas these first two are known. So if you were filling out this worksheet by yourself, it would be considered wrong if you started with anything besides 63. But if you had a 63.7, that would not necessarily be incorrect. It's an estimation we don't know for sure. And of course, I slap a little milliliters on the end of that. So you always wanna have your units there. On this guy over here, Okay, it's in between 79 and 80, so I know for sure it's 79 something. And if I'm looking at my increments, so this is 79, this is 0.1 here, 79.1. This guy here is 79.2. Wow, my handwriting is whack. And the meniscus is in between those, so I actually know for sure that it's 79.1 something. Now is it 79.14, 0 0.15, 0 0.13? I don't know for sure because I'm estimating at that point. I said five this time. So again, I know it's 79.1 something for sure. I would bet a million dollars on it, but I'm estimating that five at the end there. And so the moment that you have to estimate a number, that's when you stop measuring, okay? So you always stop once you estimate one time exactly. I would also like to point out how this first measurement, we were able to go to the tenths place, one spot after the decimal. But over here, we went to the hundredths place, two spots after the decimal. It's like, well, what changed? How come you could go further on the second measurement? Well, that's because my graduated cylinder was more accurate over here in my second measurement. See, these tick marks go to the point 0.1 place, whereas these tick marks only go to the ones place. So what determines how accurate my measurement can be? Uh, well, that's actually the tool that you're using. So the graduate cylinder itself determines uh, what kind of precision you can have. So over here with this guy, I'm looking, okay, it's definitely 30 something. I know that for sure. The meniscus is, you know, it's right around the 32 mark. So I know it's 32 something. So these are no for sure. But then is it 32.0, 32.1? Uh, it looks like it's right on the line to me. So I wrote a zero there. You might be thinking like, Mr. Pilcher, 32 and 32.0 are the same thing. And I do and I don't agree with that. In a calculator, they are the same thing. But when we are measuring, okay, we always want to write down every single thing that we know and that we estimate it. So saying 32.0 lets your person, lets whoever reading your numbers know, like, okay, it's not just like 32 point something and we have no idea. I'm telling you, I think it's about 32.0. So you're giving them a little bit more information. So even if your estimation is zero, okay, you still include that even if it's a zero. So sometimes you'll have numbers that end in 0.0 or 0.20. Uh, and that's okay. You do need to include that when you estimated that number. Don't start throwing zeros on the end just because it looks pretty. Only throw them on there if you actually estimated that value. 
So here's some practice down here that you guys can get to if you want. Uh, the Andrew key will be posted on this page, so you can go ahead and check those later. Uh, and that's that for today. I'll see ya.